It's the 18th of July. I want to tell you about a Scottish military hero who fought for two countries. Not Scotland and the UK, he fought for the United States and Russia. He was born here in 1747 and he died on this day in Scottish history. Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi. If you're interested in the people, events and places in Scottish history, then subscribe to Scotland History Tours and click the bell symbol to be notified of new videos. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. If you look up Mercurial in the dictionary, it should say John Paul Jones. The only thing is that that's not what he was christened. It was simply John Paul. He was born in this house in our Brigland on the Solway coast. His dad was a gardener on the estate here. He was the fourth of a large family, but they didn't all survive. You see, maybe poverty can be idyllic when you breathe the fresh sea breeze and paddle the warm Gulf Stream, but I'd still rather have a winning scratch card. Born a year after Culloden, this was as far away as you could be from the troubled highlands and still be Scottish. There was a little port here at Carristhorn, a couple of miles down from his house. And as a child, he would come down here and play amongst the boats. Whenever he got the opportunity, he loved it. His elder brother went off to the Americas and he did well for himself, eventually with a plantation in Virginia. Now John clearly had the same drive, but he was destined for the sea. At the age of 13, he left this little port and crossed the Solway to start a seven-year apprenticeship as a sailor in Whitehaven. Round the British coast, across the Irish Sea, and of course, ultimately, the West Indies and America. With his elder brother in the Americas, still British colonies in the mid-1760s, John's early career was working the transatlantic trade. Let's not beat about the bush. Slave ships. He worked the slave ships, his brother had a plantation in Virginia. It was perfect. Apparently not. He decided that this was a disgusting trade. Eventually. He got off a profitable boat in Jamaica and never got back on it. Now, after a while, a ship put into port with a Kirkubri captain who offered him free passage back home here. Perfect. Apparently not. On the way home, the captain and the first mate both died of yellow fever. Oh no! And none of the other crew had navigation experience. Oh, double no! But young John saves the day by steering the ship back here to Scotland. Ho ho! And as a reward, he becomes the master of the ship and gets 10% of the profits. Yeah, dancer! He's only 21 and he's got a proper who's the daddy job. Perfect. Apparently not. On the way home, on the second trip, he has a guy flogged and later the guy dies. Now, 18th century sailor dies sometime after a flogging. That's not even a like, let alone a retweet. But rule number one of ship's captains, if you're going to flog a man who's about to die, make sure he's not a member of an influential family. Damn it! The tollbooth in Kirkubri. Temporary accommodation until it's confirmed that the cause of death was in fact yellow fever. You'll be leaving the tune anyway though, John, I. No problem. He soon gets command of another ship, this time with guns. Perfect. It's perfect as long as a dispute over wages doesn't become mutinous and you run the ringleader through with a sword. You didn't do that, did you? So your seafaring career over, aye? He'd come a long way from the gardener son in Kukubrishire, and now he was never going back. The fortune that he'd accumulated would remain here in Britain without him. Where could he go? To Virginia, where his brother had lived but recently died. Somebody needed to take care of the estate and those seagulls. So, how would you escape British justice? I moved to Virginia and a change of name. Nothing too fancy, just add Jones to the end. So now he's John Paul Jones. The British authorities will never twig to that. They'll just think he's the bass player with Led Zeppelin. All he needs to do now is grow his hair, wear a floral shirt and find a guy who can play guitar with a violin vo. 
and the disguise will be complete. Now, he started taking guitar lessons, but this was the mid-1770s. And you know what happened in those rebellious British colonies around that time? How convenient for somebody who was seeking to avoid British justice. I'm not saying that John Paul started the rebellion, I'm just saying it was convenient. They were looking for people who were sailors to build up a navy of this naughty, nascent nation. A nation in a shooting war with the very people whose justice John Paul was looking to escape. Turns out, John Paul, now Jones, was an enthusiastic rebel. But he had to start again with nothing but a Masonic handshake, which, as it turns out, is exactly the qualification you need to become a first lieutenant in one of the new country's new naval ships. Perfect. Right, I'm supposed to cover this in 10 minutes, and I'll be honest, I'm feeling miserably. He had lots of adventures that we don't have time for. He continued to show genius at sea and a disrespect for senior officers above him. And let's be honest, the men beneath him as well. But you couldn't doubt his effectiveness. He captured British vessels, he destroyed British vessels, he sunk British vessels. He had a knack of outwitting the world's greatest naval superpower time and again. But he kept rubbing people up the wrong way. If you're Scottish, remember when we were kids and we used to mask a swear word with the expression, get to France? Well, the American naval authorities told John Paul Jones to get to France, to do what he could for the cause, but out of the way like. Now, on entry to a French port, he was the first naval captain to fly the new flag, the Stars and Stripes. Benjamin Franklin was a commissioner in France at the time, and he and John Paul Jones became firm friends. John Paul Jones and his men terrorised the British coastline like starfighters trying to blow up a Death Star. Now imagine you were British, and when I say that, I mean late 18th century British, when Britannia ruled the waves and not just Ibrox Football Park. Your parents had seen rebellion suppressed in Scotland. You'd subdued the great European powers. Your nation was building the world's biggest empire, and you had the world's most powerful navy to protect an island nation. You felt pretty safe in your bed. You certainly didn't have to worry about the colonial fighting on the other side of the Atlantic. And then, some jumped up jock flying a fancy new flag lands on England's shores. John Paul Jones terrorised British waters so much that British naval ships even had to be brought back from the Americas to defend the Imperial homeland. Perfect. No, it was perfect. I mean, you know something's going to go wrong, but you don't know what. I'm going to mention three things that deserve much more attention than we have time for. He invaded Britain! That's right. America invaded Britain in April 1778. He made a landing in Whitehaven across the Solway there, from where he'd sailed as a youth, remember? Now, knowing the town, he made a daring raid to burn the shipping in the port. He split his forces in two. They made a landing. Well, perfect? No. It would have been perfect, but for the fact that whilst John was scaling the walls and forcing the town's garrison to surrender in their barracks, the group who were supposed to set fire to the boats ran out of oil for their lamps. <laughs> they went in the local pub to ask, do you have any spare lamp oil so we can set fire to your ships? Nah, mate, we just sell beer. All right, that'll do. So these American sailors took the opportunity to get pissed, forgot what they were originally there for, and escaped again, having only set fire to one ship. Right, we're going to make a second landing on the other side of the Solway in Scotland, and this time, no cock-ups. What are we going to do there, boss? They came across here to St Mary's Isle behind me by Kirkcubri to go to the house of the Earl of Selkirk and kidnap him. That way, we can exchange him for sailors being held for, or press ganged even, by the British. So they make a successful landing. They get to the house. They break in. But the Earl of Selkirk isn't there. Now, some say that they just took the silver and were nothing more than pirates. Others, that he saved the Countess, who was home, by letting his near mutinous men take silver, bought it from them later, and returned it to the Countess after the war. Now, which version you believe depends on whether you watch Fox News or CNN. 
Now, the more comments there are below, the more people YouTube shows this video. So, in the YouTube comment section, can you choose? Just say pirate or patriot and give the thumbs up. Let the cross-Atlantic battle commence. Now, the most dangerous, deadly and ultimately pointlessly heroic event in John Paul Jones's tormenting of the British fleet must have been the part of the American Revolutionary conflict which happened the furthest from American soil. On the 23rd of September 1779, the nascent American Navy in a ramshackle ship borrowed from the French and held together with safety pins and sticky back plastic attacked a British convoy in the North Sea off Flambra Head. It was here that John Paul Jones, in the heat of battle, asked by the English captain if he gave up, said, I have not begun to fight. He might have been the father of the American Navy, but he was still Scottish. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'll give fuller details of this battle in the member site, right? To find out the member site, there'll be a link in the description below, and hopefully the existing members don't mind the rest of you joining in and uh, seeing that video. Now, at the end of it all, John Paul Jones gained awards and accolades in France. But at the end of the Revolutionary War, the Americans decided that they didn't need and really couldn't afford a navy. Their best ship was given to the French to cover debts. The navy wasn't big enough to give John Paul Jones the admiral ship that he thought he deserved. He had to find a living on the sea elsewhere. Now, Catherine the Great, Empress of Russia, could use a man like John Paul Jones. And so he served as rear admiral in the Russian navy. Perfect. But John being John, he rubbed the Russians up the wrong way as well. He finally returned to France on a pension from the Russian Navy. And in 1792, on this day in history, he died alone in France 12 days after his 45th birthday. The French placed his body in an unmarked grave, but they did put him in an alcohol-filled coffin to preserve the body. They assumed that the Americans would want to come to collect their great hero and father of their Navy. 113 years later, they eventually did. Finally, it was brought back to the United States in a warship accompanied by three cruisers. Seven battleships met them off the coast and salutes were fired as they sailed the Chesapeake to Annapolis. Perfect. John Paul Jones was finally laid to rest in a magnificent marble sarcophagus in the chapel crypt of Annapolis Naval Academy. But he started life here on the Solway Coast, a simple John Paul. Please like, share, and spread the word. Hamendok is going to be a lama alive. Cheerio and Rasta.